And now we will read God's word from this wonderful passage in Luke 15, beginning at verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So the father divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven And against you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. A very good evening to everyone present here. I said good evening. I really praise God for this exclusive privilege he had given to, to me to be here with you this fine evening. And I'm so thankful to Pastor James Harrison and Associate Pastor Reverend Smothers and all the church leadership for giving me this wonderful opportunity. I'm thankful to Dr. Moses, Dr. Richardson, who are from my town back in India for connecting me to this church. And I'm also thankful to my host, Brother Karanaka, who is here with us this evening. And Pastor James, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Um, So let me straight away come to this text. This is a very familiar passage. Pastor announced it's a very familiar passage. But the title always remains in our Bibles as Lost Son. He was lost and found, but still our Christianity views him. So I don't want to call this text as a lost son parable, but it's a story of unlost father. And I title my sermon as Divine Life, TWs. You may be wondering what those Ws are, because we live in an internet age And three W's all the time takes us to World Wide Web. And sometimes three W's, wine, woman, and wealth. But these three W's are nothing but three questions. Three questions to have divine life. We all know this passage very well. So I'm not going to explain the whole passage. I'm just going to deal with a certain part of this passage, verses 17 and verses 18. And from that verse... I just want to raise up three pertinent questions. Three questions from the two verses. 
and how we can really enjoy the divine bliss with these questions. Questions are very interesting. Some questions are tricky. Sometimes some questions are uh, very difficult to answer. And some questions we know the answer, but we cannot give the answers. And even in Gospels, Jesus raised more than 153 questions. So questions are very important. Often we need to question ourselves. There was a lawyer flying to Chicago from Bahrain. So next to him was a young man, an Indian sitting to him. The lawyer began playing game with this young Indian. He was asking the Indian many questions. The Indian got tired. And finally the lawyer said, let's play a game. It's a challenge. Let's play for money. So you ask me a question, and I cannot answer your question. I will give you 500 Bahrain dinar. And if you cannot answer my question, you just pay me five dana. So the boy was so excited, the young man. If I cannot answer, it's only five BD. But if he cannot answer my question, I'll get 500 BD. What a great deal. So first the lawyer asked the question, you know, how far is India from Bahrain? And then the young boy tried some time and said, no, sir, I cannot answer it. So here is your five BD. And now it's the young man's turn. The young man asked the lawyer, uh, lawyer, can you tell me what goes up into the up to the hill with three legs and comes down with four legs? So the lawyer began searching. What is it that goes up to the hill with three legs and comes down with four? So he searched at Google and he made a research for hours together. And uh, almost they reached Chicago, but the lawyer could not give the answer. Uh, so the lawyer has to give him 500 BD. He gave 500 BD to the young man. And now it's again the lawyer's turn. The lawyer asked, now tell me, what is that which goes into the, up to the hill with three legs and comes down with four? Then the boy gave five BD and said, I too don't know that. So sometimes questions are tricky. Sometimes questions, they give us a sense of direction. But this young man in this parable, he raises three pertinent questions. So let's read uh, verse number 17. But when he came to himself, he said, and some other version, versions read like this, when he came back to his senses. That means till that moment, he was senseless. Now he came back to his senses. It's a time, it's a period of enlightenment. So now he raises a question. Can someone think with me in this church, what will be the first question? You need not give me any 5 BD. Just try. Exactly, Pastor. The first question is the question of our identity. Who I am? Who I am? If I tell you what to answer this question right now, how will you answer it? Who I am? The very question of our identity. How do you explain that? This man now thinks, how many of my father's hired servants? He is now thinking of his father, the sense of belongingness, who I am, to whom I belong to. This is a very important question in our life. If we don't have the answer for this question, we need to think, we need to ponder, and it's the right time to think for us, what is our identity? This young man thinks his identity. He thinks his, about his father, the sense of belongingness, who I am, to whom I belong. And the answer is, who I am, the question of identity, the very first page of Bible tells us very clearly. You and I, we are all created in the image of God. That's our identity. Our passport, our IDs, these are all temporal. But we have a permanent, eternal identity. We are all created in the image of God. Do we have that identity? Do we maintain the identity? Are we in the image of God? Now the question comes, what is image of God? In Latin, it is called imago Dei. Imago Dei. In English, it's image of God. What does it mean? It means having the characteristics of God, having the spirit of our creator, having the attributes of God. If God is holy, we should be holy. 
If you believe that God is love, we should have his divine love in us. That's how we carry the image of God in us. We are created in his image. So we ought to maintain the image of God with us. Now he thinks of his image. He thinks of his distorted image. He was lost. Now he's found. Amazing grace. He was lost and now found. And now rediscovering his identity. He thinks of his father. I belong to someone. Sense of belongingness. And he thinks of his image. Restoring back the lost identity. This is a phenomenon, everyday phenomenon. Everyday phenomenon. We need to restore back if there is any distorted image of God in us. So now this man works out that, this young man, and he thinks of his father, and he thinks of his image. We should be the image bearers of God. So you may question, you may think sometimes, we know, we, sometimes we don't take this serious. We never think of giving attention to the image of God, carrying the attributes of God in us, having the spirit of God in us. We never think of it. But it's very serious. If you are not in the image of God, there is something wrong with us. There is something danger with us. I see a lot of friends here. Maybe there may be some Chinese and Koreans also here. Not to offend them. But you know these names will be very interesting. I love these names. Chinese names. How do they sound? Ching Chang Ching, something like that, right? So once there was a Chinese couple who lived in America. They had their first son there in America. They named him as Ching Chang Chen. And from there, they moved to Germany. They were blessed with one more son. So they named the second son as Ding Dong Ding. And from there, they moved to Africa. And that day, the nurse in the hospital gave the third son to the Chinese parents. And the Chinese parents were shocked because the third son was not resembling the Chinese parents. He was black and resembling the African. So they confused and they named him as something wrong. So if we don't have the image of God in us, if we don't resemble him, there is something wrong in you and in me. So we need to think it very seriously. Do we really possess the identity of God? We are created in his image and do we really have that image in us. Otherwise, there is something wrong in us. Now let's begin to think like this young man are we, am I, in the image of God? Do I have the attributes of God in me? Do I have the characteristics of God in me? Do I have the spirit of God in me? A very basic question of our life. Who I am. People should find the image of God in you and me. There was an Indian great man, Sadhu Sundar Singh. Many of you know about him. Once he went to England to meet his friend there. When he went to his friend's house, his friend's daughter was playing outside the house. Then Sadhu Sundar Singh tells the little girl, go and tell your dad that his friend came. The girl runs inside and tells to his dad, dad, some of your friend is here. And then dad was busy with his office work and tells the girl, ask his identity who he is. The girl comes back again to Sadhu Sundar Singh and asks Sadhu, uh, what's your identity? Who are you? What's your name? Then Sadhu Sundar Singh softly tells her, go and tell your dad that I am his friend. Again, the girl runs back to dad and tells dad. He simply says that she is your friend. And again, the dad tells, go and find who he is. Again, the girl comes here and asks, who are you? Then again, Sadhu tells the same thing. I'm your dad's friend. So dad said, go and find out everything in detail. Now the girl tells dad, I can't run back and forth. Then again, the dad, curious dad, asks this girl, can you tell how he looks like? Immediately, the girl replies, dad, he exactly looks like Jesus. Look at that. People should find the image of God in us. In your workplace, at your home, in your neighborhood, they should see the image of God. They should see Jesus Christ reflecting in us. So this man, this young man, he thinks of his identity, he thinks sense of belongingness, and he thinks the question, who I am? He is discovering his identity. He discovered that he is created in the image of God. Now his image was distorted. Now he is restoring back his image. Bible tells us very clearly. Corinthians 1st chapter 6, 19. Don't you know that you are the temple of the living God? 
we are the temples of the living God. Wherever we go, we carry the presence of God with us. We are just like mobile temples. Wherever we go, we carry the holiness of God in us. So we are in the image of God and God's Holy Spirit dwells in us. If you read Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, chapter 19, verse, it says, you are the dwelling place for his Holy Spirit. So let not the Holy Spirit grieve in us. Let us never lose the identity. We, are, we ought to maintain and carry the image of God in us. And his second question there, and let's read the verse there. How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. So he says here, I will arise and go to my father. What will be the second question? As pastor announced, I'm also a teacher. So even when you ask me to preach, the teacher in me comes out. Kindly bear with me. What will be the second question? What's that? Yeah. Where should I go? Where should I go? The question of destiny. Do we have a destination? Few years back, maybe five years back, I was in stage Charlotte, and that week was very special because that was Billy Graham's, the great champion of souls. That was his 95th birthday. I didn't go there, but I read in the newspapers. Even you can find this wonderful thing in Google. So the next day I was reading the newspaper in the internet. Then I was really inspired, I was really inspired to read the speech of Billy Graham. So the people want to felicitate him, and they didn't expect a major address from him. But Billy Graham, in midst of his Parkinson's disease, he came there, and then he gave a very astounding a message, a very brief message. He started something like this. Today I'm wearing a very costly robe, a costly suit. And again I will be wearing it for the second time when I die in my coffin. But when I die, I don't want you to remember about my suitings. I want you to remember about one specific thing. And then he, he, he told about a story about Einstein. Albert Einstein was once traveling from Princeton in a train. And then the train conductor came there and asked him for a ticket. So Einstein was searching his pockets. He could not find his ticket. Then the TT, the train conductor, recognized Einstein and said, Sir, I know you. You're the great man. You're the man of the century, Einstein. You, you need not show me your ticket. I know you might have purchased it, but it may be missing somewhere. You need not show me the ticket. Kindly be seated. And then the train conductor goes ahead. And when he turns back, again, Einstein was searching here and there and below his seat and up and down. Again, the train conductor came back and said, Sir, why are you so panicked? Kindly be seated. You might have purchased it, your ticket, and you need, not, you need not show it to me. I know who you are. Then Einstein replied, You know me who I am, but I don't know where I'm going. So I need my ticket because on the ticket, my destination will be printed. That's why I desperately need my ticket. Then Billy Graham tells, that day Einstein forgot his destination. But I know who I am, and I know where I am going. I know who I am, and I know where I am going. Do you know your destiny? God placed you here for a very specific purpose in Bahrain. Have you ever thought of your destination? Do you have a goal? Do you have a dream for your life? Do you have a dream for eternity? How do you live then? How do we live then? Now this young man thinks of his destination. Where should I go? And he tells to himself, I will arise, I will get up, and then I will go. Getting up is very interesting. I have a few African friends here, and in the deep forests of Africa, early in the morning, the lion comes out of its den while brushing its teeth. It tells to itself, hey, yesterday I ran just 60 miles per hour. And within a fraction of a second, I missed the deer, and all night I starved without food. So this morning, my resolution is, I should run this morning 61 miles per hour, and at any cost, I should catch the deer, and I should eat the deer. On the other side of the jungle, the poor deer also comes out, and while brushing its teeth, early in the morning, it tells to itself, oh, what a great danger. Yesterday, I ran only 60 miles per hour. And by God's grace, within fraction of a second, I narrowly escaped death 
I almost went into the death trap and came out. Even today, if I run the same speed, my life will be finished. But today, my resolution is I should run 61 miles per hour and I should save my life. Imagine being created in the image of God. How much speed we should maintain? The double speed like the lion and the deer? We should have a destination. Where are we going? Do we have dream for our life? Bible tells where there is no vision, people will perish. But where there is vision, people will flourish. This young man now has a great dream, has a great vision reaching his father. I don't know why still the Bible tells him as lost son. Now he's a restored son with a clear-cut vision, with a clear-cut direction towards his destination. He's running towards the goal. Biblical prophecy in the book of Joel says, your young men will see visions. Your old men, your young men, your children will prophesy, they will see vision. So do we have vision for our life, vision for eternity? Do we know our destination very clearly? How are we living then? Let's think of this young man who could think of a great eternal value in his life. Number one, who I am? The question of identity. Number two, where should I go? The question of destiny. And number three, let's read uh, the remaining verse there. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your high servants. And he arose and came to his father. So can you think with me, what, what is the third question? What will be the third question? Yeah, what should I do? The question of responsibility. Do you know that you have a responsibility upon this earth? Not your mechanical job or lethargic lifestyle. We all have a specific responsibility. God assigned each one of you and me a very specific blueprint how to live, what to do. Now this man discovers what is his responsibility. Responsibility is always with accountability. Only one life. The world famous cricketer one time from England, P.T. Stead, he said beautifully, only one life. Soon it passes away. But what you have done for Christ remains forever. What you have done for Christ remains forever. What should I do? Here this son now is in the process of reconciliation. And this whole phenomenon of transformation, the process of reconciliation and confession is very important. How do we confess our lives before Christ? Do we accept reality? How much amount of reality we can accept or digest in our lives? Many young people are here. Maybe uh, once we cross 30 in India, uh, if we try this reality check, it will be interesting. How many of us can accept certain things as reality? So the question, the exercise is, how did you deal with your first gray hair? How did you deal with your first gray hair? We don't accept the reality. We try to cut it. Or we try to cover it. Why? Confession. God likes a clear cut confession. Because God knows everything what's happening in your life. He knows everything what's happening in, in your life. So confession is very important. No dramas. Someone said like this, Christians are the best actors than Hollywood, Tollywood, or Bollywood. We act. As Shakespeare said, life is a drama, world is a stage, you're all actors. We do the same thing in Christianity. No. A confession. A dying man on the cross with Jesus Christ. He said, remember me in your kingdom. That's a confession. Thinking of God's kingdom every day, every moment, living eternity upon this earth is our challenge. Now this man thinks of confession and forgiveness from Father, reconciliation with Father, healing the broken mendedness. Imagine how much we do this. Sometimes I think if at all I'm a Christian scientist, I should invent a new app in the phone. You know, what is that app? 
Or maybe uh, everyone may not have access to apps, but at least a small instrument, a red light and a green light, connected to your heart. For example, you have something against Pastor James in your heart, but when you see him, you brush your teeth and say, hi, good morning, Pastor. Then immediately the red light blinks, ding. What will happen? Think of it. Wife and husband goes to a supermarket, a super mall, a, a supermarket, a mall. A beautiful young lady walks here and there. The husband's lustful eye is upon, all, upon the lady all the time. What happens when they come home? The poor wife asks the husband, why, sir, your red light is blinking many times in the mall? If at all we were to wear this green light and red light and roam around in Bahrain, how many times the red light will blink and how many times the green light will blink? Innumerable times the red light and finally it may explode. Think genuinely. We need to live a pure life, a holy life, holiness God. God said, I'm holy, so you should be holy. He's light and we should walk in the light. Now this young man comes to the father. The interesting part, the divine celebration begins here. That's why someone said very beautifully like this, a seeking sinner and a seeking savior finds each other easily. Now, uh, when the son was far away, his father saw him, felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. In Jewish culture, it is something odd for fathers to run on the roads because they wear something from top to bottom. And with that, uh, with that dress code, they cannot run on the roads. But this father, keeping away the culture, throwing aside the tradition, looking his son, he ran. He might have folded it up awkwardly and ran on the road, literally to hug his son. What a loving father we have. Unconditional love. Amazing grace. Now he comes, he hugs, and now the son confesses. But look at the father. What did he say? What did the father do? He kissed him. He hugged him. He kissed him. When the son confessed all before the father, the father said, bring quickly the best robe and put it onto him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. That's celebration of life. If we don't have communication with our Heavenly Father, we simply act, we cannot celebrate life. You may be laughing out, you may be enacting that you are joyful, but deep inside your heart that there is no joy. There is always a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness depends on happenings, but joy comes from God, so joy is eternal. It happens only when you confess everything before God. When you heal the broken mindedness, when you become one with God, when you are transformed into his image, then you enjoy this divine peace, then you enjoy life and you celebrate life. That's what we call divine life, celebration of divine life. Now look at it. His father gives him the best robes. And his son, he could not have a dress or robes all those days. He was utterly lost. He was in despair. But when the father saw his dirty clothes, he removed and said, there is a dress code to come into my palace. So he changes the dress, the best robes, like Christ did on the cross of Calvary. And he gave us the robes of righteousness. Do we have that robes on us? And as a symbol of covenant, he gave the ring to the son. Do we have the agreement, the covenant between father and us? And still, he gives uh, the shoes, the sandals, as a felicitation. Feet fitted with gospel to proclaim the good news, as Paul quotes. And then he t still he says, let's celebrate by eating a fattened calf. That's what happens in life when you discover these three W's. Discovering our identity, defining our destiny, doing our responsibility. Now, friends, let's think of this young man. His life was transformed. He was lost and found. He was restored. Now he is celebrating life. These worldly things cannot give us joy. All these are temporal. But think of eternity. Think of eternity.
Let me tell you about a young man and then quickly challenge you. His name was William Borden. In the year 1910, he was graduated from Yale University. His father gave a huge gift for him. And with that money, he traveled to China and India and returned back to States. He told his father, Father, I want to give away my property to missions, and then I want to be a missionary to China. And father said to him, if you do that, never step back again to this home. William Borden, he settled all the money to certain missions. And that time, Hudson Taylor was ministering in China. He has sent certain amount to Hudson Taylor to China. And then he started his journey from America to China. On the way, he stopped in Egypt to learn the language, uh, consul language, uh, to reach the Chinese Muslim, the Chinese consul Muslims. And so while he was at uh, Egypt, uh, he, was terminal, he became terminally sick. He was attacked with spinal meningitis. Then people said, you need to go back to America. But when William Borden started his journey from America to China, he took his Bible and he wrote a statement behind his Bible. He wrote the first statement on his Bible, no results, no results. Because he has given his wealth for missions and he has set all his property for the missions. He gave his share for God's ministry. That's why he could write behind his Bible, no results. And then when he was struck with spinal meningitis, people advised him to go back. Then again, he took his Bible, and beneath the word no results, he wrote another statement, no returns or no retreats. No returns or no retreats. He died. He died before reaching China. And on the day of his funeral, the pastor, while burying him, when he saw the Bible, he opened the Bible, the last page, and saw one more statement of William Borden. Number one was, no reserves. Number two, no returns. And number three, no regrets. No regrets. Even if I die, I know my destiny. I did my responsibility. I discovered my identity. That was William Borden. Great life. He died. But still, his memorial hospital is in China. Borden Memorial Hospital. Even... After many, many years, today we could think of him. We could talk of him. He's still alive in our thoughts. What kind of life we are living? Live a legacy for Christ and leave a legacy for Christ. This young man now challenges us to think these three questions. Who I am? Where should I go? And what should I do? The question of identity. Number two, the question of destiny. And finally, the question of responsibility. He discovered his identity. He defined his destiny. He did his responsibility. Shall we all stand up for a while? Commit ourselves to the Lord one more time. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding sign. Let's rededicate our lives to God. Let's think of these three questions. And if you're really interested in celebrating divine life, this is the phenomenon I recommend you this evening. Discovering our identity, defining our destiny, and doing our responsibility. My request, Reverend James Harrison, to come and close with the word of prayer. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Dr. Pranjit. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the message that you have given us through your servant. And Lord, it's a familiar passage, but a unique way of looking at the situation of the so-called lost son who was restored. And Lord, it is indeed a picture that each of us have 
For we profess your name. We know, Lord, that every one of us was once lost, but we're found as we walk with Jesus. But Lord, it's a good reminder. Who am I in you? Where am I going? What's my true destiny? And what shall I do? Because I am redeemed and restored, and I belong to you. Father, forgive us for slipping back and being confused about our own identity at times. Or, like this son, we feel, Lord, that we can never be anything except a slave. Certainly not a son. But, Lord, you loved us. You sent Jesus into the world to die for us. You raised him from the dead. And you made it possible for us to really be fully restored. Lord, help us to see who we are in Jesus. Where we're going because of Jesus and what we should be doing and all about for Jesus and because Jesus' Holy Spirit is in us. So Lord, tonight, may each of us recommit ourselves to our identity, to our destiny, and to our purpose and what you want each of us to do for you. We ask and pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.